Well, good morning, everyone. Before we actually read the scripture, I want to tell you a little story. When I was growing up, Sunday afternoons in my family was one of our customary times for going places. So after church, we would zoom home and change out of our Sunday best and take off for points unknown. So sometimes we'd go over to New York City and visit a museum, or maybe we'd go someplace like Madison Square Garden to see a circus. And sometimes we would just go to one of the many places that are historic in New Jersey. Or sometimes we'd just go someplace to see what sights we could see. There was, however, one slight hitch in our family's enjoyment of those excursions. And that hitch was me. No matter how hard I tried to remember to pay attention and stay with the rest of the family, something would just catch my eye and I'd break ranks to go investigate it. And eventually, it would occur to me that I was somewhere else than the rest of my family. I have to tell you, the first few times that happened, I was pretty scared. I'd frantically scan the crowds to find them, hoping pretty hard that I could slip back into line without getting noticed. But unfortunately, way more often than not, my dad would have to come and find me, which was twice as hard when I was a moving target. And so it wasn't very long before I learned that the best thing to do when I got lost was just stop and wait in one place, preferably a visible place, so that my dad could see me from his height. I gotta tell you that by the time I was seven or eight, I had no fear anymore of getting lost. And the reason was, I learned to trust in my dad's ability to find me, no matter how far afield I went. Looking back, I realize now that I came to that trust in stages. I learned to believe in my dad because of the sheer repetition of being found by him over and over and over again. And maybe more than that, I knew that he wanted to find me no matter how exasperated he was when he did. You know, it's the same for all of us in our relationships. We know that to trust anybody is a two-way street because trusting someone requires not only the sincerity of one making a promise, but also the faith of one receiving it. Building trust is a matter of time and trial because there's always occasions when our trust is gonna be put to the test. And when that happens, we're presented with this scary opportunity to take another step forward, to take the risk of believing someone based on the road you've traveled so far with them. For both people, it's about the risk of vulnerability and self-disclosure It's also about the risk of giving one's word and receiving it at face value. And these things that are so true about our human relationships are also true of our relationship with God. The challenge of what it takes to build trust and to learn that trust in stages describes what was happening in this Exodus story that we're about to read. I'm going to read some of the first verses, and then we'll read some verses together. This is from Exodus 17. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, 
but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, well, give us water to drink. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? What do you, why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt so that you could make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I going to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. So join me now at verse 5. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? See, in this episode, we can see that the people of Israel were on their way to the Promised Land and that they were having some serious faith issues. People were complaining, aren't we there yet? I'm dying of thirst out here. Has God left us? Does God even care? You see, it was because they were focusing so hard on their immediate circumstances that they couldn't see the big picture anymore. The problem as they saw it, was that the wilderness they were traveling through was literally God-forsaken, even though God had promised them otherwise. And you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we look back on this story, and it's so easy for us to be disappointed with them, and even kind of amazed that these Israelites lost their faith so soon especially after all the miracles they had seen so far. From our perspective, we can identify that the presenting issue was that they were so caught up in their discontent that they forgot all the evidence they'd seen of God's power and providence for them. And when we look a little deeper, we can see that they were caught up in the strong temptation to turn their faith into sight. At this point in their journey, they wanted God to be wrapped up neatly in a box or an ark or, an, or a golden calf. They wanted a God they could see and touch like a security blanket. So one of the lessons of this story for us is that the answer to the question, is God with us or not, can't depend on what I see and touch. This episode invited them, just as it invites me, to believe on the basis of what I learn of God's character over time and through my trials. It's all about the perpetual invitation God extends to enter into a real heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the living God. And like any true relationship, I must learn how to trust God's word. And especially when God, when life calls it into question. You know, it's so easy to believe in God when life is going my way. When life is hard, that's when faith gets hard, too. And so this story challenges you and me to take that risky step into a deeper faith, a faith that's founded on what we have known and what we can know of God's love and presence. 
You know, another one of the risks in any relationship is finding out new information, making new discoveries about myself or another person. And making those discoveries presents me with the opportunity to go deeper into the relationship or not. What is difficult is that choosing to go deeper means that I will have to change what I thought I knew. And that's scary enough. But what may be even scarier is that it also means that I will have to change in accordance with my new information in order for that relationship to grow. This is equally true of our human relationships and our relationship to God. I have to confess that in my journey, letting go of what I thought I knew about my faith in God, Christ, and what I thought I knew about the scriptures and the way that he was calling me to follow hasn't ever been easy. It's always been scary and uncomfortable, especially the part about having to change the way that I live my faith accordingly. But I also have to say that going through that kind of reformation has helped me to understand more deeply what Jesus meant when he said that the truth will make me free. It makes me free to become who God is creating me to be. And I did say creating because in Christ I am always a work in progress and so are we all. The good news of this story is that God is an expert when it comes to making my new growing life possible. Even in the midst of the deserts we may find ourselves in. As you and I journey along this road, it may take some time to discover the possibilities which God's grace will create for us. But this story also shows that even in the midst of discontent and disorder and misplaced faith, God can make this cool, refreshing life flow through the most desperate conditions, quenching the most, even the most dehydrated faith. And all we need do is drink. You know, Jesus might have had this, this story from Exodus in the back of his mind when he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread and seek first the kingdom of God and all the things you need will be added unto you. Both of those verses are about trusting God for our survival, yes. But even more, they are about trusting the relationship believing the bigger picture that God's love and care can be depended on, especially when the answer is not directly in sight. It promises us that the solution will come as I keep walking with Christ and following him the best that I can. As I thought about this story, I realized that this passage also has an insight that applies to our Menden Church at this time in its journey. I have to tell you that I used to wonder why the Israelites had to wander in the desert for 40 years. But that was until I learned that they had to outgrow the mentality that they came to have as a result of living under the Egyptian oppression. They had to unlearn the mindset that they gained there so that they could live as free people under God. See, it was that mentality that defeated them before the battle was even fought when, they, for, when for the first time they were on the verge of entering the promised land. It was that mindset that made them think it was better to go back to Egypt than to become a new nation under God. 
Well, like the Israelites, we too, at this time in our church's history, might be feeling the same kind of frustration they felt when we say, well, aren't we there yet? Is the Lord among us in this process or not? From this story, I gain the trust that the Lord is in this process, moving us forward. I believe that there are some old ideas and strategies that may have to be released. And I believe there might be some new information we may have to wrap our minds around together. But the promise behind our forward movement movement is the same as it was for Israel. Remember, God said to Moses, take your staff and some of the elders and strike the rock and water will gush forth. Well, the promise for us now is that God will take what we have at hand in this church, all the gifts and talents and resources this church body possesses, and God will use the leaders that Christ has called. And God will show us all what we need to do to complete this leg of the journey. And when we follow God's lead, when we follow what we know God is up to, new, refreshing, exhilarating life will flow from this church like a river. Amen? Amen. And here's the challenge of this story. Ask us to ask ourselves, will we as God's people here in this church agree to pray about taking this scary step of faith? And if so, will we say amen? Amen. amen. Then let it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. amen.